thank you so much for, for allowing me to, to present our work on, on the combined hard labor transplant. As you see, the fantastic job that, that, that has been done here. We just want to present our, our data in this small nuclear patient that is getting larger and larger. I don't know, here on three papers that presented today. Uh, whenever we have this procedure, we have a group of physicians, surgeons, anesthesiologists, cardiologists, hepatologists that look at this as a, as a team. And today I'm going to present, first of all, historic aspect. How do we get there? Clinical indication, donor and surgical technique, and most important, perioperative and postoperative management. Whenever you try to do these procedures and new technology, it's not about one person, it's about a team for to be successful. The difference between success and failure, that and failure is a great team to be working with you. <clears throat> As I mentioned before, in Stanford we have the, the tradition of having the normal strong way that created a pioneer work on heart transplantation, understanding the physiology, understanding the care, understanding the parameters for success. You mentioned before, but the source of put together liver transplantation for the United States, and we are able to put the technologies in order to approach this problem. Important is to mention the literature, the first patient ever done for combined heart liver transplant was this patient, Stormy Jones, that I had the privilege and pleasure to care for in Pittsburgh. This was a patient that had a hypercholesterolemia type, uh, I think it was type, type 1, in which developed an H2 multiple uh, myocardial infarction due to coronary obstruction. And as you know, this, this disease is based on a metabolic defect in the liver. So at the time, combined heart liver was done for her and she was successfully treated and led for many years. This was in Pittsburgh, it's a proud city of, of all this advance presented in the first page in the newspaper. Also in Pittsburgh, for the adult side, the first adult that was done was the governor of the state of uh, Pennsylvania that suffered amyloidosis, in which, as you know, affect the heart and the metabolic defect is in the, in the liver. Treated successfully and went back to work. <clears throat> The need for heart liver transplant slowly has been going up over time as we feel more comfortable in the United States. And you see the ages is getting more and more pediatrics and also adults. If you know that, that, that the defects are actually two organs, most of the cases in which it has been done have been for metabolic defects, hypercholesterolemia, family has hemodosis, idiopathic restricted cardiomyopathy in which they develop congestive hepatopathy has been the, the most important uh, case. This is our team in which we started working on this project, hepatology fellows, cardiology researchers, in order to do. And this is the core of the problem. <clears throat> Traditionally, metabolic disease of the, of the heart, hemodosis, ischemic heart disease, <clears throat> or they have not had any previous cardiectomy. So the surgery is straightforward, essentially there's no adhesions. If you look at the liver, metabolically, they are almost intact, but the metabolic defect affects systemic, especially the heart. What we're addressing today is not that. What we're addressing today is this. When you have a patient that has on-time procedures, single ventricle physiology, multiple surgeries, in which you spend three, four hours just getting the heart out, that's when the problem comes. And we'll explain later what the technical problems are, and you have a cirrhotic liver at the same time. How we deal with these two problems at the same time? So, as we say, historically the liver failure has been considered a contraindication for heart transplant. Any patient that has cirrhosis or poor hypertension is not considered traditionally as a candidate for, for heart transplant. At the same time, patients with heart failure with liver disease are not considered candidates because of, of the, with single ventricle disease. So heart failure in the setting of liver disease could not be ignored. And just to give you a little, uh, a little numbers, over the last 20, 30 years since Fontan has been adopted as a single technology for, for single heart, there's approximately 30 to 40,000 of these patients right now in different stages in which over time will develop liver failure. And most important is that we still have to deal with them, is that patients that are between 15 and 40 years of age. Just give me a little uh, uh, re uh, review. Hypoplastic left heart is a disease in which the left heart is underdeveloped. You have a atrial heart, and most of the physiology comes from the right heart. The corrective procedure, essentially, is a palliative procedure. We 
you like get the IEC and the, the Ethereum Akiva and then create a conduit need to create drainage into the both pulmonary veins and access the blood from the upper body and lower body. This is considered a palliative procedure in which the patients are not synodic and they can function. This has been a life-saving operation for the last 40 years. And most important, you can create a state in which there's very low mortality in the early ages. Our problem is now that these are starting to be 20, 30 years of age. And how do you deal with this problem? The physiology of the liver injury, as you see, there's passive congestion because there's no valve effect in the digestion to prevent back, back pressure into the liver. So as you see, there's decreased cardiac output and increased central venous pressure. And over time, this pathological biopsy that you see, you start depositing iron in the hepatocyte, the sinusoidal dilatation, and eventually, with the oxidation of all these compounds, you start developing fibrosis in the central vein and creating a necrosis of the liver. If you look at the project, progression of the disease, over time, you see this liver, sorry, first being congested, then starting off with hyperperfusion due to fibrosis, then atrophy, and then you develop uh, significant uh, findings of, of full bone uh, cirrhosis and you see full hypertension. So, if that would be the whole problem, at least you can say, well, it's palliative. But the problem is that, with like any physiology in which you have a chronic liver injury, you are going to develop hepatocellular carcinoma. So these are the patients in which you have to be surveilled like any other cirrhotic for developing the malignancy. This is a pattern of palliative formation, central vein, uh, around the central vein and across uh, around it. So how do we put all this together? First of all, the team cannot be one person. It has to be a multidisciplinary team that assess both the heart, heart, and the liver to standardize the, the, the workup. You cannot get in every patient a biopsy all the time. You have to standardize all your procedure according to the treatment and follow up of the, of the kidney disease and the, of the heart disease and the liver disease. Most important, communication. We have a daily huddle on management of these patients and all of us get together and form intraoperative and postoperative management and immune pressure. Any surgery is possible, <clears throat> but if you need immunosuppression, it's not adequate for a patient with die infection. So we need to agree that the immunosuppression is going to be significantly adequate not to produce the malignancies of these patients and viral infection. Just as a gross uh, point, the organs are produced separately. Both things, heart and liver, go at the same time, and the cardiectomy started first at the time in the recipient. As soon as we know that donor is suitable, the cardiectomy started. Because as you remember, to take out the heart is going to take about four hours due to a tremendous amount of adhesions. And most important, the patient needs to be also be on bypass. At the time in which the cardiectomy is done, then the donor team performed the in-block procurement of the heart and the liver in one, in one, in one block. So, uh, the disadvantage of having a sequential treatment, a sequential transplant between the heart first and the liver first, is that as you reperfuse the, 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 do the heart procedure, you prolong the ischemia time of the liver. If this produces delayed cardiac function, increased vasopressor when you release all the cytokines and the necrotic byproducts of the liver when they reperfuse. This impairs the graft function and produces vascular, vascular congestion, hypertension, and bowel ischemia. Now, if you stage a procedure also, you can start with the heart, but then you have to face the poor hypertension, the wide swing on IVC, when you plant the IVC with the preload, and most important, they can be a uh, complication with thrombolysis and coagulopathy. So, either way, you have injury if you do it on a sequential basis. So therefore, we developed and we have used the experience of all the centers using the in-block technique, in which all the organs in the recipient are dissected at the same time, all the donors are dissected in a, in a block, and implanted at the same time. I'm going to present the case of a child of seven years old that has had a Bacter syndrome, the single ranger called a, a, 
physiology. Okay, let's see if we can give you some time to put the play. No, you have to put the play at the bottom. At the bottom, there's an arrow right there. That one. Okay. So, in cases in which they have had many catheterizations and many cardiac pro pro procedures, and this child, you open first the abdomen because you don't have the assurance that you have good vessels to cannulate in the groin. So in this case, as you see, we started the laparotomy, and we exposed uh, the, the abdomen first. See here, we put the retractor, and we're cutting this short, but in the way in which we did it, is that we expose first the abdomen to see if we have good access to the IVC in case that as we go in here to the groin to put the cannulas, we have suitable vessels. We already have access into the abdomen if this fell as we do the cardiectomy. Then here's a heart team assigned with, with, with a uh, sternotomy. He has had already four sternotomy before. So I'm not going to put all the parts of that, just to tell you that the, the cardiectomy on this patient took about three, four hours just to get the heart, the left ventricle, the attachment, the chest wall, and the right ventricle from the, from the pleura and, the, and that. So we cut it short. I'm sorry about the heads, but that's what it is. Okay, so you see the tremendous amount of scar and shard that we had already taken out the organs. So here's a process that is trying to isolate the heart and go on the, on the, on the bypass machine. By this time, we already dissected the abdomen, and as you see here, they're already preparing here the, the resection of the, of the major vessel. After they finish the dissection of the vessels and we finish our dissection, the patients on the pump, we split the back from the middle and from top of the cava. So they remove the heart and remove the liver at the same time. Sorry about the head. That was thoracic surgery looking at the abdomen. At the abdomen. So essentially, <coughs> you have here the lower cava clamp. You have a cannula here draining the portal vein into the bypass machine. We split the venous return of the cardiac bypass and use the, that one for that for the portal vein and another one for the for the lower body circulation. The important part here is that we have to work together. We have the liver attached to the heart, so therefore we wrap the heart on the ice I slap and put it in the left shoulder. Because the first anastomosis that is the left ventricle. It's a posterior anastomosis, so we have to flip the heart in order to start first with that anastomosis and then flip the organs down as you see. The whole cavity here is empty because all the organs are in the left, the left chest. So as they progress now with the anterior row of the, of the, of the right atrium, of the left atrium, sorry, you will see that as soon as they can, they can start visualizing anteriorly the wall, we're going to split the organs down, and as it works there in the, the heart, we are already anastomosis in the lower cava, portal vein, and artery. We do all the anastomosis at once because when you reperfuse, you're going to have a low perfusion system in which you want to bring your oxygenated blood from the artery into your new graft. So all anastomosis, portal vein, hepatic artery, and, and IVC have to be done at the same time that the heart is in anastomosis. <coughs> Here we're starting to rewarm. As you see, it's very slow for, for the liver to perfuse, but both organs are perfusing at the same time. Right here, both organs are already reperfused, and as the most is done, and we are closing back the, the diaphragm in order to have integrity of the diaphragm for ventilation and for uh, spaces. <clears throat> very good. So, just a few still pictures. We left the heart team work for about three, four hours just during the cardiectomy. After we have everything dissected, as I mentioned before, the patient's on bypass, everything's taken out, and the block of heart and liver with the cava intact is left. Very important is that all the hemostasis around the graft, around the upper cava has to be done, all the frenies. 
it's very difficult to mobilize these organs after we put them down. Okay, another point of view. This is uh, a very important situation. Some of the cases that they have venous abnormalities of a multiple vein drainage, we have to do unifocalization of the body of the of the pulmonary veins. And these are donor pericardium creating unifocalization of the veins in order to promote a new graph. All that is done when the patient from bypass and, and all this is done. And one of the combinations that this type of syndrome have when they have an anomaly that has renal uh, return and also a uh, heterotaxia, you see that it's here in a cavus on the left side. That is important that we have to understand it because at the level of the diaphragm there's usually a shunt that will bring that blood into the pulmonary arteries and we have to deal with that, remove the shunts and create length of the IVC. This, the, the graph is already in place, and you see that some of these veins that do not drain well as a patch, we have to create conduits in order to go to pulmonary, pulmonary artery. It is very important to, 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 to let you know that you have to close the diaphragm enough but not to produce obstruction at the level of the cava. This is an important point, is that this IVC was all the way here. When you see the white aspect, that was the graph. This was all the way the left side. And this was the glen shunt bringing to the pulmonary veins. You gotta reset all the cava, remove all the vessels, bring it all the way as low as you can, just on top of the renal veins, and then anastomosis, anastomosis of the lower cava of the graft as well. This is a pretty linear polar vein, you have anastomosis to the other artery. This is a surgical uh, time and blood draws, and in this case, because of the significant amount of surgery we had before, we needed a significant amount of, of ICU time. And hospital length, but he left and never was needed again. This is the average blood usage in space, and it's a tremendous amount of blood loss due to the cardiectomy. The blood products that were replaced. If you look at the national history of uh, heart liver, this is the curve that it is a survival rate. Uh, according to years, it's improving, but it's still going to be 80% patient and graft survival. Most of the losses after the first year are infections. This is the five-year survival, it's about 70% nationally. This is what our patients uh, overall have done and the complications that we have had, but none of them has lived in the year. Up to this point in Stanford, we have performed a total of 14 of these operations combined heart liver, eight women pediatrics, and the rest are from adults with no patient loss. And most important, all of them, what we found out is that we have had more than 70 biopsies in all these patients. And just one case of symptomatic uh, antibody mediated rejection, no graft dysfunction. All the patients are alive, up to nine years were transplant, and minimal rehospitalization. This child, after, after the transplant, threw the first ball in the game of the Giants in the stadium. What did I say at the beginning? Whenever you do something that improves the care of the children or patients, always publish. We have published our, our data to be of use to all the programs that have to face this. This is not just the United States. All, any place that you have single ventricle physiology, you are going to face this. Again, the team, ICU team, neonatal care ICU, the operating group that spent the time and effort to give supply all the needs for us, the radiology to be our back on call to have all the tests on time, the heart team after, the, after post transplant care to follow these patients carefully, our liver team and heart team, fellow, fellow, fellows, trainees, all the nurses on the floor, outpatient clinic, families that trust their children on us, families that care for this patient the rest of their life. And this is a phrase that I like that probably we all share here. I don't come to work every day to do the same thing that I did yesterday. I come every day to work to do something new. These are experiences I want to tell you, and most important, I want to share it wherever we can be of help. Thank you.